first and foremost, before I jump into the word, I just, um, while I know that many of you aren't aware, on behalf of Millie, myself, and her family that are here, we just want to thank you all for your prayers and your encouragement as we continue to navigate the sudden death of Millie's mom on Wednesday. Uh, it was something that was unexpected. There'll be a celebration of life service this Tuesday at 6, excuse me, at 5.30. The viewing will begin in the sanctuary, and at 6 p.m. the service will go. You are all definitely welcome to come. But we just want to thank you once again for lifting us up, keeping us in prayer. We know it's because of that that we've been able to endure throughout these past few days. Now, in preparing for today's message, uh, or in preparing for Tuesday for that message, and the video that we're going to have, a collage of pictures and stuff, we've been talking about amongst ourselves, we've been sharing stories, everybody's been, you know, it's a great time when the family comes together. It's a bad situation, but it's a great time because they're sharing memories, expressing different thoughts, and providing pictures, loads and loads of pictures. You know, they're searching stuff. Uh, her sister Yolanda has been looking through a closet. Her other sister Nancy has been going through stuff. Her other sister Esther, I don't know, she just goes through anything, her mind all over the place. They're laughing because they know exactly what I'm talking about. Millie's been at home going through pictures, going through stuff, and they're like, okay, take this one. Here, have that one. Have this one. And it's tons of pictures, and they're sending me some awesome stuff left and right. But how many of you have this thing known as a smartphone, right? It's called a smartphone, but I got to tell you, there's nothing smart about this phone. And, you know, every, Apple and everybody else is probably like, yeah, right, buddy, you invented and talk to me about it. But it, Depending on the type that you get, depending on the type of phone, it has a different type of what's known as a storage capacity, right? You have different phones that have this many gigabytes, this many tigabytes, this many lulabytes. I don't know what they are anymore. I, I've lost it at past the tigabytes. And what it means is that you're allowed, hey, here we go. You're allowed to store a certain number of files, a certain number of pictures, even a certain amount of voicemails. Have you ever, have you, I don't know, I have it, where I've got tons of voicemails and it says, hey, you're reaching full capacity, you're 98% full, you know, you're about to fill. And then, when you're loading pictures or you're getting more stuff, you get the dreaded notification that says, hey, not enough space. Not enough space. Has that ever popped up on anybody? Okay, I want to make sure I'm relating to, to some people that know what I'm talking about. Don't nod at me because you've never had that. <laughs> She's like, yeah, yeah, I don't know what's going on. But it says not enough disk space, either on your phone or on your computer. This dreaded window, it pops up, and it will say not enough space. And then when it pops up, if you've gone to Facebook and you see it, it pops up, it gives you another button. It gives you an option, and that option, what it says on it, it says manage your storage space. Manage your storage space. And then what happens is that basically you press that button, you're brought to a brand new window where it has tons of stuff, and you have to now decide what you're going to do, what you're going to keep, what you're going to let go of, what you're going to move around, what you're going to do here and there, deleting this, moving that, and making space available. I remember, what was it, about a month ago, Hannah? This happened to us one day in our service. We used to use our phone before we started getting the cameras or before we purchased them. We used my phone, and I didn't keep track. You know, I was getting pictures left and right. I have stuff from years ago that you just keep, or I always do the crossroads refuel. I always adjust the picture. I have it. It's on file. You look through my stuff, tons and tons of pictures. So that particular day, I give Hannah my phone. We set it up. We always record the service. We record the service so then we can upload it live. I mean, upload it on Facebook. Great, no problem. But then what happened was, since I didn't track, I didn't monitor my space, I didn't manage my storage, because I had so much on there that when we started the service, we weren't one minute into it, two minutes, not enough storage space, just cut off, and that was the end of the message. No more message. It was gone. And I had some people, you know, Sharon said, Marcel, that was one of your best messages. I was like, hey, yeah, I can't wait to share. She's like, no, I'm going to share it. I go upstairs and uh -uh, no message, no storage, nothing. 
Nothing was available. Nothing was there for me to be able to, to share with others because I didn't manage my space on this accordingly. I didn't manage it. So what could have turned out to be a blessing to others basically became mute. It was mute. It was nothing that could be shared with others. Now, why am I sharing this with you all today? Why am I starting talking about phones, computers, and files and all of that? Because today I want to talk to you about managing your storage space, but not your storage space here or on that computer there. Managing your storage space here and here. Managing your storage space here and here. Now, whenever a person whether they're part of a relationship, you know, a couple or something like that, or they're part of a group of friends or something, and they want to make a difference in someone's life, what they have to do is they have to manage their storage space. When, when you're involved with someone, you have to manage your storage space. And what I'm saying with that is you have to manage the storage space of your life. Your life now changes because you're in relationship with someone, whether it's a intimate relationship or whether it's a relationship with family, whether it's a relationship with friends, things have to be adjusted. So you manage space in order to make room. What are you making room for? You're making room in your heart. You're making room in your mind. You're making room in your schedule. You're making room in your energy level. You're making room in all your resources. You're making room for that person in your life. In order for you to be able to do things, you're making room for them. In Mark chapter 2, which is the, what we're going to be talking about here, we're told of a story about four guys. These four guys who happened to walk by, a guy who was paralyzed on a bed or on a mat, it says, and what they did or what they didn't do was to disregard the guy and just go past him and say, you know what, he doesn't mean anything to us. They weren't content with just simply walking by and saying, you know, I don't have time for him. In other words, I'm not going to make any room for this guy in our lives. But no, they didn't do that because they knew something. They knew they had heard Jesus was preaching. He was talking in a particular place, and they knew this guy needs Jesus. He needs Jesus. How many of us know a friend or family member that needs Jesus? I'll throw both hands up, you know. I know a lot of people that need Jesus. I know a lot of people <laughs> that need Jesus. But they weren't content with just walking by. They weren't content with just moving on. Now, when you read the whole story, what they did was they actually took action, but their actions that they took wasn't anything convenient. The actions that they took wasn't anything easy. What they did was very difficult and very challenging because Jesus... He was teaching at a home, and the scripture says that there was no room available. There was no space. There was nothing available, no room, in other words, for this guy who was paralyzed to be able to brought in and make a connection with Jesus Christ. There was no room for him. So they, these four guys, they made space. They made space, and how did they do it? They made a way. How did they do it? How did they make a way? They made a way by managing the space in their lives, by managing the space here in their minds, by managing their space here in their hearts, because they allowed room for compassion. They allowed room for time. They allowed room for creativity. They allowed room for their reputations, because many of us are so concerned with our reputations, who we're seen with, who we're beside, who's going to talk about me, who's going to say this about me. They made room for that. In other words, they set that nonsense aside. They set that junk aside and said, I'm going to make room. And they made room for their energy, and they made room for faith, space, was made available in their lives. Space available. Have any of you ever seen those signs? Those signs that say, they're big signs that say space available. You normally see them in front of a store or in front of a big building or something like that, and they're big, and they say right across the top, space available. Why are those signs up? Why do people put these signs up? Why do they even consider putting these signs up, space available? Well, because whoever the manager is on the other side of that sign wants someone to know, wants people to know that there is room available, 
that there is space available within their facility, that there's room available, that there's space for them, that in other words, in some way, shape, or form, they've cleared out the old. They've cleared out the old things or the old tenant or the old person or the old things and moved them out of the way, and they've made space for something, for someone, for some business, for something new. That's how we need to be with the leading of God. That's how we need to be with the direction of God. That's how we need to be with the guidance of God. And listen, that's how we need to be with the correction of God. We need to make space available for the things of God, for God and his spirit to come into our lives here, here, all over us to come in, that we should have these huge signs held up saying, God, space available. Lord, there's space available. Father, there's space available. Holy Spirit, there's space available. Jesus, there's space available in my life for you to come in to fulfill your purposes, not my will. The scripture says, not my will be done, but your will be done. So space available for him, for him. Those are the signs we need to have up. But instead, guess what signs we put up? You know, We'll walk around with these old raggedy motel signs that say no vacancy. You know, you've seen those signs on on Route 13 or wherever else, these old motels with these signs that, you know, some of the lights don't even work. So instead of saying no vacancy, it's saying no vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy. I mean, it almost sounds Spanish, you know. No vacancy, no vacancy. Stickles, this is not Spanish, all right? It's no vacantes, no vacantes. Okay, thank you. This is my Spanish, you know, uh, monitoring section here. No vacantes. You know, people think you're speaking Spanish because you're here. No vacancy, no vacancy. In other words, no cows here. That's what you're saying. If you take out the N and you say no vacancy, no cows here. But we walk around. I say that because we walk around with these signs that say no vacancy. And God will come to us with fresh ideas, with new revelations, with something that could be life-changing for us. And what do we hold up? No vacancy, Lord. There's no vacancy for you here, Lord. You know, God will come to us with, with something new, with something powerful, with gifts of the Holy Spirit. And No, Lord, no vacancy here. In other words, Lord, I can't wrap my mind around this thing about prophesying, this thing about you know, speaking in other tongues, this thing about this, there's no vacancy for you in my life for this. I can't wrap my mind around it, so there's no vacancy. God will come to us with encouragement, no vacancy. God will come to us with love, no vacancy, Lord. God will come to us with his healing touch. I don't believe in that. No vacancy, no vacancy. God will come to us with deliverance with an opportunity to be delivered from our sorrow, from our sickness, from whatever it is that we're dealing with, and we put up this huge sign that says no vacancy. Father, there's no space available for you here. We won't tend to you. We won't deal with you. We can't serve you. You know, in a hotel, when they say no vacancy, it's basically we can't serve you here. No vacancy. God will come to us with an opportunity to bless someone else, And we hold up the sign, no vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy. We make no room for the things of God. We have to make room for the things of God because when we don't accept the things of God, we're basically telling him, our storage capacity is full, Lord. Our storage capacity is full. It's full here and here, and we can't accept anything from you. This is God we're talking to. God, the one that wants to provide us. The creator of the heavens and earth. The one that wants to provide for us. So many things we're saying, I don't have space for your blessing. I don't have space for your healing. I don't have space for for whatever it is you want to provide for me. I don't have space. And what God is trying to tell us today, folks, is that he wants you to manage your storage space. He wants you to manage your storage space. You see, with these guys, they were able to come up with a plan. They managed their space. They were able to come up with a plan because they made space available in their lives for God to pour into them, pour into them ideas, pour into them revelation, pour into them compassion, pour into them love, pour into them strength and energy to be able to say, you know what? 
We're not going to leave this guy in his condition. We're going to carry him, and we're going to bring him forth to get him to what he needs, to get him through. I mean, they came up with a plan to lower this guy through a roof, through a roof. How many of us would have came up with something like that? I mean, I, I could picture the conversation. Guy on the floor, he can't move. Tons of people, and we got to get him from here to there. How in the roof? Yeah, roof. Do you have a rope? I don't know. Does anybody have a rope? But they came up, you know, we don't know what their thinking was. The scripture doesn't say they used the rope, that they used anything. It just says he was lowered down with the bed. Not just, hey, the body was lowered down. The bed, him in it, he was lowered down. So we don't know. All we know is that the scripture says they uncovered the roof. And then it says, when they had broken through. That's a key word there that I'm going to come back to. When they had broken through, they let down the bed with the guy on it down. Jesus had his sins forgiven, and the guy was now totally healed. The guy got what he needed because they made space available to be used by God. They made space available in their minds. They made space available in their hearts to provide something for somebody else. It wasn't necessarily for them. The space that they made available, the space that you make available, is not always going to be for you. The space that you make available may be for somebody else. In this case, with these four men, the space that they made available was for somebody else. They made space. They broke through, it says. They broke through. Folks, we need to break through some things this morning. We need to break through some things in our life. We need to break through in order to make space for God's glory to shine through us, for God's glory to shine through all of us. Amen? For God's glory to come in, we need to break through through the things that we've stored within us. We need to break through the roof. We need to break through the anger that we have stored. Some of us have stored anger that we've held on for years. We need to break through the anger. We need to break through the, st uh, the stored insecurity that we have. That stored insecurity, we need to break through it. We need to break through stored sorrow. We need to break through stored defeat. We need to break through stored uh, anger, stored depression. We need to break through stored lust. You know, I'm hating on all these things, but many people have lust. Many people have other things, and God is saying, I want all of it. I don't want just your bad, sorrowful times. I want it all. I want you to break through all. I want you to make space because I want all of you. I don't want a part of you. I don't want a compartment of you. I don't want a section of you. I need the fullness of you so you can endure the fullness of me. The fullness of me. Scripture says that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, not the apartment, not the storage utility, not the closet, not the back room, not the bathroom, the temple, the fullness, the temple of the Holy Spirit, and God's saying he wants us to break through so we can have the fullness of him. Folks, we need to break through, break through. We need to break through. Have you ever heard of the term breaking ground? Breaking ground, right? When we break ground, it's basically the ground being broken. Hey, way to use the same words to explain the same thing. We're breaking ground, but basically it's when you're starting something, when you're either going to build something or you're going to plant something, and it's referred to as breaking ground because you're basically, you're going to make progress and you're going to go further to doing something that nobody else has done in that particular area, into a new area. In some cases, when you're breaking ground, they actually do a ceremony. They pull out a shovel. They have somebody take a nice picture as they're doing this with the shovel, even though that person's not going to do any of the work. But that's a breaking ground ceremony. Now, when we're thinking of breaking ground, when we're thinking about this dirt, this dirt that's been there, this dirt that hasn't been moved, this dirt that hasn't been touched, this dirt that's just been there all along, when it's time to break ground, Guess what you have to do? Guess what the dirt has to do? The dirt has to make room. The dirt has to make room for the newness that's coming in. So if you were planting a seed, the dirt has to make room for the new seed. The dirt has to make room for that new seed. It has to make a way for this new seed that's being placed in. And not only does it have to make room for the new seed, guess what? 
It has to make room for the roots that are going to come out of that seed. It has to make room for the new roots that are going to spread. It has to make room for growth that's going to take place. It has to make room for the trunk that's going to expand. It has to make room for all these things. It has to clear a path for growth and that the old dirt needs to make room for these things and move from where it used to be to make room, space available for the new. So what I'm getting at is that we need to manage our space here for the new seeds, for the new seeds of faith, new seeds of faith, too often we run off of old faith. We run off the old, like, I remember when God did this. And we're like, yes, God did this. He did the miraculous. And then in the same conversation, we dare to say, but I don't know if he can do this. So that's basically you're running off of the old faith. You don't have the new faith. And God wants to plant new seeds in us. He wants us to make new room that the old dirt be set aside for new faith for new faith in us. Scripture says that faith is as a mustard seed. So that's a seed that needs to be planted. It's new faith for us, for the newness, for new vision, for new hope, for new desires, for new dreams, for new aspirations, for new lifestyle, for new ways of living. In Acts 9, verses 36 through 42, we're told of a story about Peter where he resurrects a woman. The woman's name is Dorcas. Peter was in another town, and basically the people knew he was there, so they reached out to him because Dorcas had died. Dorcas was an incredible lady. She was one of the, the few ladies, if I'm not mistaken, one of the only ladies who was referred to as a disciple. Now, I'm not talking about one of the 12 disciples. She was dis referred to as a disciple by name. So when she's referred to, when Scripture talks about a woman by name, hey, you know, anybody's name, forget a woman, man. If they mention you by name, there's importance, there's significance behind it. And with Dorcas, it describes her as a woman full of goodness, full of goodness. But Dorcas had passed away. She had died, and these people had brought her into an upper room, second floor, an upper room area. And they had gotten Peter, and Peter came. They escorted him upstairs, and he was up there. But while he was up there on this second floor, before he did anything, you know, I can picture Peter. He's kind of there surveying everything that's going on. Peter did something that nobody else has done, that you read in Scripture, you can read throughout. Jesus didn't do it. Paul didn't do it. In fact, we're in chapter 9. So Paul, in the earlier, in the beginning of that chapter, he's just starting his conversion. He had just finished his conversion. So his ministry is just starting. So Peter was the first one to do this. And guess what it was that Peter did? He cleared the room. He made everybody get out of the room. Jesus didn't do that. When Jesus was going to do a miracle, hey, right here, all right, be healed. Hey, rise up. No, okay, y'all can't watch this. Don't look at this. You know, get out the way, you know, cover, cover it up. No, but Peter said to all of them, he emptied out the room. Why did Peter do this? Why did people have, why did Peter have the people leave the room? He made them leave in order to make room for the newness that was going to come forth. You see, there were old mindsets in that room. There was old faith in that room. There was old thought process in that room. There was these old things in the room. You ever been around someone where you're trying to share your faith, you're trying to share your testimony, you're trying to share what God's done, and they're like, Mm, but I don't think God can do that now. And they're, they're downing what you're saying. They're downing your, your praise. They're downing the glorification that you're giving to God. They're downing all these things. So Peter, it doesn't say it in Scripture, but I can almost see him there like, you know, I'm ready to pray for this lady, but there's old faith here. I'm ready to pray for this lady, but there's old thought processes here. I'm ready to pray for this lady, but there's an old mindset here that is going to try to hinder the movement of God here because God is willing to walk in, but he's not willing to walk into a place where he's not accepted. He's not willing to come into a place where people have closed him off and have not made room for him to do the miraculous. So Peter said, you know what? Everybody get out. Everybody get out. And then the scripture says he knelt down and prayed. And Dorcas rose. Dorcas rose. She got up and she was alive once again, 
She was alive once again. Now, can you imagine the people, the people being told, get out? Can you imagine, you know? You know I, I picture some people with an attitude to be like, excuse you. I didn't want to be here anyway. I didn't want her to come back anyway. You know, she didn't do any good for me, so I don't care if you bring her back. But they would be angry. They would be upset. They would, you know, they would be offended. You know, we, we've studied about taking the bait of offense, but they would be offended. But why would they do this? Why would they take that upon themselves? Because they wouldn't be able to see the big picture. They couldn't see the big picture. I was, I used to work in government contracting. And the thing that I hated, that I truly hated, it affected me, was, it was when it was time for the government agency, the contracting officer to come and renegotiate the old contract. We hated it. We hated it because they would come in and it would almost seem like a threat to us because they were coming in to renegotiate the contract and we were like, uh, you know, uh, this doesn't look good because they were ready to cut costs here and cut costs there and cut costs here and we're trying to do this and we're trying to do that and they're cutting costs and cutting costs and we would feel like it was a threat but the only reason we felt like it was a threat because we had a self-interest. We had self-interest. We weren't thinking about corporate interests. We had self-interest. And you know what that self-interest was? We wanted to make money. So we didn't want them to cut stuff, renegotiate the old to make new. No way. Leave it as it is. We're getting a good quality amount here. We're getting a good hourly rate here for these employees. We're good. Don't make room for the new contract. But little did we know, you know, and, you know, you, this is hindsight 2020, and you all might disagree with me, but what the government was doing, what these agencies were doing, they were renegotiating the old in order to make way for new opportunities, new money, where they could shift money from here. Let's, let's, let's deal with this old so we could shift money for new programs, for new contracts, for new projects, for all this here and there. But because we didn't see the fullness of it, the big picture of it, we saw it as bad, really bad, because we had our own self-interest. We weren't seeing the big picture. We need to manage our space. We need to manage our space. We need to manage our space here and here so that we can make room for God's big picture in our life. God's big picture in our lives for his kingdom, for the body of Christ. We're all part of the body of Christ, and we need to stop allowing self-interest to occupy the space of body interest, the body of Christ interest. We need to stop allowing selfishness to occupy space. We need to stop allowing self to be the center because when we put ourselves in the center, we just took God out of the center of it all. And God needs to be in the center of our lives, amen? God needs to be in the center of it all so that we have to manage our space in order to allow him to do it in order to allow him to do it. Now, as I'm saying all of this to you all, you all are probably like, hey, that's easier said than done. And I know when it comes to managing space, it, it, it's a process. It almost seems like a task instead of a blessing. And if I could break it down to you this way, I'll, I'll share, it to, uh, share it with you using this analogy. As I shared with you all a couple of weeks ago, Millie and I just completed 11 months of renovation. 11 months, in fact, Exactly this time last year, this week last year, we said, hey, we're going to embark on a renovation. Let's start. And we just finished. She'll tell you we haven't finished because she has a laundry list of stuff that she's like, mm -mm, you haven't crossed the T's and dotted the I's, but we won't talk about that right now. Um, but we embarked on this renovation process, this project, and it was tasking. It was tasking. There was a lot to be done. It, it, it made it seem to those who were looking from the outside that the task was greater than the blessing. You know, we had to manage our storage. In other words, what I mean by storage is in the house, we have three bedrooms, but we were renovating the living room, the dining room, the kitchen. So the bedrooms had to get full of the stuff that was now occupying the living room, dining room, and kitchen. There was no room no room to walk around because we move stuff into the bedroom. We'd open the door and look and it's like, 
Okay, close the door because we couldn't walk in there. Other stuff, we were doing this to get into my bed at night. It was like, okay, let me walk around, let me climb around. And then imagine the dogs in there. We had a mini fridge in our bedroom. We had a microwave in our bedroom. We had all this stuff. We had to rearrange. We had to make room, and it was tasking. And it was so tasking because it required an adjustment in our life. It required an adjusted way of living for the renovation to take place. Listen to me. It required an adjusted way of living for renovation, for transformation to take place in our home. So we basically, we were like, okay, we know it's a task, but here's the thing. We didn't allow the task to supersede the blessing. We didn't allow the task, the, 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 the craziness, the chaos, the chaos, all the stuff to supersede the blessing. Do you understand what I'm telling you? We didn't allow all that work to overwhelm us. We didn't allow it to bring us to a point where we felt like we were defeated, where we felt like we were weak, where we felt like we need to quit. We can't do this. We can't go any further. We can't live like this anymore. No, we endured and we kept going because had we quit, we have never would have achieved or realized the blessing that was waiting on the other side of the renovation. The blessing that was waiting, key word here, on the other side of the transformation. The transformation. Now we're reaping the benefits. Now we're reaping the benefits. You know, Millie loves her kitchen. And you know what? I'm reaping the benefits. You know why? Happy wife, happy life. She's happy, I'm happy. God is good. Mm, yes. So we're reaping those benefits, but the task was now insignificant in comparison to the blessing. So ladies and gentlemen, what I'm trying to tell you is that you have to realize that you need to make room for the things of God. And in making room for the things of God, it requires an adjusted lifestyle. It requires an adjusted way of living. It requires you to adjust from the old ways, the old things, the things that you were used to doing that you say, you know what, I can't make room for those things anymore. There's no more space available for that. I need to make space available for the new. I need to get rid of things. I need to clean house here and here. I need to get rid of these things, things that I'm hanging on to, old lifestyles, old ways. I have to tell you, I tell you all I'm very transparent up here. The way I was living before I finally decided to fully give my life to God, because my family's here and they know I've done it, and then stop, done it, and stop. But finally, when I came through, there was old mindsets I had to get rid of. There was old ways, old styles, old attitudes, old thoughts, old things that I had to say, there's no more room for you. I can't allow you, if I'm going to continue in my pursuit of God, if I'm going to continue to allow him to pour into me, I need to make room for what he's pouring in. So the ways I used to be, the ways I used to act, the ways I used to talk, there was no more room for that. And it was tough because every now and then you're walking that path, that straight and narrow, and your eye wants to turn because the longing for the old, the old ways, the old feelings, the old things that used to stimulate you, that used to motivate you. And God's saying, you don't need the old. Make room for the new. Make space available for the new because the old things, that stimulation, that motivation fail in comparison to what he can provide for you right now. Fail in comparison to the joy, to the goodness, to the happiness, to the hope, to the strength, to everything that he has available for us if we would just make space available. If we would just open up to what he has in store for us. If you just endure because it's a transformation process. That process to get me from here to there, and I'm not done with my race. You know, God, uh, Paul tells us to run the race, to finish the race. I'm still dealing with my race. I'm still dealing with my transformation, but it's getting easier. And scripture tells us that if we would just endure, if we would just keep going, if we would just finish, the blessings of God will supersede above and beyond. Above and beyond if we're willing to make space available. In Isaiah 54, 2, it says, enlarge the place of your tent. Enlarge the place of your tent. Now, I know that scripture is talking about some, but that word enlargement, when we think about that word enlargement, it's an encouragement to us to open up, to open up, to open up to big dreams, 
to open up to big visions, to open up to big blessings, to open up to big hopes, to open up to the fullness of him. But the only way we can do so is to enlarge, is to enlarge, to manage our storage space, to make room for what he's doing. Because if we keep our storage space full, you know, when it tells me, hey, you're, you're about max, that means when it's max, when it comes to voicemails, I can't get that voicemail. I can't hear from my wife. I can't hear from family. I can't receive a message of encouragement from friends or whatever because I didn't choose to manage my space, to manage my space. Now, I thank God for my sister-in-law because I was sharing with her a little bit about what I was going to talk about, and she asked the question. She said, how? So how do we manage our space? And immediately the words came out, but I was like, wow, I need to share the how. And how do we manage the space? Paul tells us how. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, he tells us, he encourages us. That word beseech, he starts with beseech. That means I implore you. I implore you by the mercies of God that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service reasonable service. He's not asking for the unreasonable. He's not asking for anything above and beyond. He's not asking you to sacrifice something that he hasn't already done and hasn't already been willing to do for us in our lives. A reasonable sacrifice. So it goes on to say, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In verse 2, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed, but be ye transformed. That's the transformation I'm talking about. How, does it, how do we get transformed? By the renewing of your mind. Renew. Renew. It's a daily process. Renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Renewing our minds is the process involved in managing our storage. Renewing our minds where we don't allow the old thoughts. We don't allow the old ways. We don't allow the old habits back in. Now, I'm going to crack on her, but in a positive way, my sister-in-law, Yolanda. She's probably looking at me like I'm going to kill him when I get home. But they'll all attest to this. My sister-in-law, Yolanda, is the epitome of renewing when it comes to cleanliness in the house. When it comes to cleanliness in the house, she is a, you know, she'll sit back. No problem. She's cleaned the house. It's set the way she wants it. Dust flies by. Grab the sweeper. Because she doesn't want dirt. She doesn't want that. Sits back down. People come in, track some stuff. Makes her way. Sweeps that up. Somebody used the bathroom. Somebody did this. Somebody kitchen, whatever. She is constantly on top of it, on top of it, on top of it. That is her. That's her lifestyle. But the way she stays on top of it, what she's doing is she's saying, my house is clean, and I'm maintaining it clean. Dirt may come in, but I'm making sure it goes out. Stuff may come in, but I'm making sure it goes out. That's the same way with us here and here. The dirt of the world may come in. Clean it out. The emotions of the world may come in to try to destroy you. Clean it out. The other stuff may come in. Clean it out. Clean it all out. Don't allow it in. Don't allow it to take place or to take space that should be made available for the things of God instead of the things of the world. Make space for the things of God, not the things of the world. So don't kill me, you know. The proving, the proving, that is the results being shown forth in our actions and our words. Basically what I was just describing to her. That's proving it. That's saying, you know, I'm going to renew my mind. Well, I'm going to prove it because now I speak different. Now I talk different. Now I act different. Now I walk different. I do all these things differently. In Matthew 12, 34, it says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's your heart full of? What are you speaking? What are you speaking to others? What's your heart full of? We need to manage our storage space. We need to make God bigger in our minds and in our hearts instead of allowing issues of life to take the place of him where he should be. We easily do this. Let's say this was the storage space of my mind, and God, this is God, and all of a sudden the trials and tribulations of the world come in. We move out God and let this fester here. We let this grow here. We let this... and. Now, there's just no more 
room for God. There's no more room for prayer. There's no more room for, for just conversation with him. There's no more room for love. There's no more room for patience. There's no more room for the fruit of the spirit because we've choked out the vine and he is the vine. So we need to realize that God is bigger than any opposition that we can encounter. God is bigger than any crisis. God is bigger than any disappointment. God is bigger than any sickness, anxiety, problems, or worry, or whatever it is that we're dealing with. God is bigger. Therefore, make the space for him to overcome those things. So we need to manage. We need to manage our storage, folks, here and here. Amen? Would you all please stand to your feet? We're going to cut the feed now. For those of you watching online, God bless you all, and thank you for being a part of us today. Hannah, if you would.